So, um, so first of all, I would like to thank Eric and the special for having me here. Um, I love Vietnam, you know, Christmas time is one of the best. I love to see Woody again. We share our project for many, many years. That was lots of fun, we learned a lot. So it's it's always nice to see some familiar faces like the two guys up there and also Julia. So I'm, I'm really happy to be here. So today I will be talking a little bit about our research on, on single atoms, okay? And I will take the first part more on the chemistry part and then the second part will be more related to the electronic properties and so So I hope that there is a little bit for everybody. And if someone has some questions, just, um, yeah, make sure we will have time. So one of our main issues, or the main issues in my group, is that we want to work for all these um, new needs for sustainability. And that's that's from our colleagues from Zurich, and they were analyzing how how all the chemical processes that we are having nowadays, if they are sustainable or not. And it turns out that 99% of all the processes that we have in industry nowadays that are related to chemical industry, they are not sustainable in the long range because they keep some of the planet boundaries. Okay, this is a very nice exercise. I think it's very good also to show to, to students and um, how we are facing these different limits. And actually, when we start thinking about how, how research and how, how um, the chemical plant works, well, evidently, if we like to work at least think of the reactor, but you cannot make a reactor if the whole thing doesn't really work. So basically, you have to keep on working on the active sites, making them as active, as selective, and as stable as, as we can. And that's a traditional view of how catalysis goes. Okay, many of you have seen this kind of plots, these are volcano plots. The whole idea is that you need something material that binds not too strong or not too weak into one particular intermediate or one particular familiar of intermediates, so that you find the sweet spot where the reactivity is best. Okay, that's a traditional view that we can calculate now with all the heavy um, DFT machinery that we are having, and we are using a product from Vienna in order to do that. So, um, so I'm also happy to see you're here. Yeah, so basically, what is the idea? Why these volcanoes appear? These volcanoes appear because you have all these kind of linear scaling relationships. See, the scaling relationships means that the, the, the absorption energy of one species really scales to the absorption energy of a different species. Well, they are not so different. This will be typical for OH compared to the absorption energy of O. And if you are having the absorption energy of oxygen, at the end of the day, it's easy to understand why these things correlate. And these things correlate up to the point but basically, you have those correlations between the transition states and the final states, or some combination of the initial final states. So you end up with one line would, would be controlling the absorption, and a second line that will be controlling how much coverage you have on the surface. And the location of these two lines uh, here is where the volcano appears. Okay? Very simple, very easy. Or it seems simple, it seems easy. If you try to do that and you start adding a little bit of complexity, that will be the volcano. In, no, that will be the volcano in two dimensions. But then, if you look for selectivity, then you are having more problems because in a very narrow energy difference, you will have a complete cliff. You will have a complete change from 100% of the product that you want to 0%. Okay, so the problem of activity is an important problem, but the problem of selectivity is a much more crucial problem if you want to have something that is sustainable. Okay, and actually, there's, well, there is one problem here is that, well, this range of energy is very close to the linear scaling relationship robustness. Okay, so this. Energy differences are really, really, very small in our scales. <clears throat> so, how do you think that we can be better than the volcanoes? Because sometimes the top of the volcanoes doesn't produce enough for you, huh? for your particular problem or for your particular system. 
And the only way to go beyond the volcano says basically by either increasing the catalytic, oh no, I don't know, I start having problems, sorry, either increasing the catalytic complexity or by incorporating alternative energy forms. Okay? And we formalized this several years ago with this idea. Most of the people um, since many, many years was working with metals and catalysis of metals. And the idea is you can, you can tune the geometric and electronic terms in very different ways to try to separate how these linear scaling relationships uh, appear or even try to break them, okay? And up here, you will find a bunch of, if I can, yeah. This one here will be single atoms, palladium nitrides, while these here are the single atoms on oxides, okay? And these two represent two different ways of breaking the linear scaling relationships by adding complexities to the metal, ah, to the material. Okay? Of course, you have the very yeah, exotic entrance of energy, you know, magnet or uh, mechanical forces, for instance, happen. So, how do we make single atoms? Actually, it's simpler than it sounds. So, you can have single atoms in metal. Alloys, in oxides, in polymers, in MOFs, so metal organic frameworks, molecular crystals, you name it. Huh? There are much more obvious than we think, but there is one thing that we need to find. We would like to have these single atoms, all of them separated, but they end up, because of the cohesive energy, most of the time they will end up forming a single ball or a single part. Okay, so what we need to find is to find a spot where we can disperse the single atoms and they need to be stable to prevent the coalescence and for the formation of large particles, okay? Because that would be the end of the, uh, the story. <clears throat> and actually in industry, well, in industry, in a uh, pilot plan, we have been able to, to use um, these palladium systems that are dispersed on, on indium oxide uh, for the formation of, of methanol from CO2, okay, which is a very appealing reaction. And this is typically the way we work. Um, we try to map all the possible experimental features to all the theoretical uh, different computations, because the problem with single atoms is that they are very difficult to identify and characterize, and experiments are not enough, and theory is not enough. So we need a combination of both in order to get to get farther than one. Okay, so that would be an idealized single atom, and this is the carbon nitride. And as you can see here, basically, what you're having is this host that presents a cavity, which has a, a coordination site for the metal atom. And in this way, these metal atoms, they look very much like a metal in an organ metallic um, compound. Okay, actually. These things move a bit. Um, so let's go to see this French movie. It's also a bit, but not much. Okay, we need to start moving. So uh, we, we just wanted to show here this is a palladium atom, uh, and this is a, the cavity of the, car uh, the carbon nitride. The whole idea here is that you see that this carbon nitride, they are very easy to move, huh? they, they, they is almost a slide. Um, uh, one or the other. And then the palladium atoms is sitting here, but it's something not only the surface, but also the subsurface position. And it will uh, be like this for the rest of the system. And actually, in, for these materials in the AXPS, what you can see is two signals. One, it corresponds to the time that the palladium spends on the top, and then the other corresponds to the time that the palladium spends between two layers. Uh, if you get the top, okay? There's not much more to be seen here. <laughs> so, when we tried these materials the first time, that was several years ago, we tried to do hydrogenation reactions, okay? And these are the profiles for the reactivity. This is just the instability uh, as a rate on the time of the, uh, of the stream. You can see they are really stable. So basically, these things, they don't collapse and they don't form two dimensional particles. But the way the reaction will go is different how this hydrogenation will happen on, on a palladium nanoparticle. So from here, if you, if I, 
so basically, um, the way you absorb hydrogen is by splitting the hydrogen between the metal atom and the ligand. Okay? So you are no longer able to split the hydrogen only palladium only, but you use the ligand, you use the scaffold as a ligand, and then you do this um, hydrogen splitting, and then you transfer to the carbon carbon bond, first one hydrogen, then the second, and then what you see is. And this mechanism is exactly the same as you would have for a molecule, huh? as you would have for a homogeneous catalyst. And this can be extended, and actually we send this to um, this kind of very complex reactivity. Don't ask me to pronounce all this stuff. <laughs> the basic thing here is that you have this moiety here, you break this bond, you break this one here, you make a bond between this guy and this guy here. And this is a way to make carbon carbon bonds in the pharma industry. Okay, very important kind of code. And you can do the same. So, this is a typical bunch of catalysts that the people was using either uh, palladium on carbon or palladium on uh, this lead on, uh, on uh, carbonates. Our system here with just one palladium atom, but also different ways of organometallic systems and grafting systems uh, to different, uh, to different supports. And if you do that, uh, you take this one and you compare it to this one. Actually, our system was a little bit more stable and it was a little bit more selective. But this is the typical thing that people in organic chemistry do. They collect the scopes, basically, they run over a bunch of molecules that look the same. So, um, yeah, I know that, that, that part here is the instability. Sorry, I said that it was the stability here, but the instability is here. As you can see, the stability here, this is extremely. Constant. That's for our material. While the palladium on the <laughs> on the organometallic system, this one here, it really decays. And there is one problem: if it decays, it would mean that you are losing palladium. That this palladium needs to be recycled. And since you want this for pharma, if you are missing some of the palladium atoms that end up in your pharma, then you will have a problem because this is one of the things. The people in the industry is looking a lot. Okay, so this is a major issue uh, in the pharma industry, not to be uh, paying leftovers in your drugs. Okay, how does this work? As I have shown you before, this is our palladium atom that is sitting heavily in this cavity here. We check the palladium could not form palladium dimers or higher things. And that the palladium was basically naked when we were preparing it. And, and we run the reaction, and you will see, and this is a nice removing, huh? Because you are having, yeah, we have the reactors, they come, they get activated. Okay, we break this bond, we keep on passing through transition states and intermediates here. There is a second reactor that comes. It makes enough space. And as you see, this palladium atom, it's really shifting inside the material to get adapted to the coordination. Huh? Because the big uh, the cavity is so big, the guy can move a little bit around and adapt all the time. And that was one of the things that I was discussing with one of you. In this particular case, the single atoms, they really can adapt here to have the best coordination all the time. Yeah, we were discussing this before. So basically, you end up with this step here, you make the final bomb. One of you flies away, and you end up to the rest of the state. Okay, system goes, it seems very, yeah, it seems very nice, and it works nice. Um, no, no, we don't want to see that. Now, there is a problem because if if you have checked carefully, the first uh, application that we found for these materials was in 2015, and that was related to the hydrogenation. And it took us more than three years to figure out what was the second application. This means problems, huh? When you see these things, is that there was something going on. And actually, uh, for the Suzuki, it took us you know, three years to, to develop that. The reason for that is that it's not so easy to choose what would be the metal that you would be needing and what it's going to be the scaffold that you will be needing. Okay? We have been working with these materials 
not only for the carbon nitride, but also all sorts of carbons. And depending on the particular application that we want to study, then the nature of the carbon will be slightly different. Okay? Now, the problem with carbons is that you end up with the structures like this one here. Okay, so you will end up, if you have activated carbon, your defects will contain some oxygen, you can have a lot of nitrogen containing carbons, and basically you will end up with zooms like this one, and you will not know which is the active, uh, the system that is responsible for the reactivity that you are seeing. Okay, just because they are so messy and we do have so many configurations. So a typical way we do that is we generate lots of models for lots of different intermediates and try to figure out um, which are the best comparison for the systems that convert the best to experiments. Okay, and in this case, these are the exhausts, and you can see the different motifs they can generate different. Uh, Exhausts are actually the problem with exhausts is that there will be an average of many of these situations depending on uh, how you have synthesized the carbon, and it's difficult to spot which is the real active site that you are seeing. Okay, and that's a very general problem for these kind of carriers that are so um, difficult to, to assess. And this is why it drove us to, to try to use something else. Okay. Uh, so in collaboration with our colleagues from, from Zurich, but also from, um, from the Barcelona Supercomputer Center, what we tried to do was take the images first and try to see if we could say a little bit more about the microscopy images. Okay? We wanted to automatize the way that the microscopy images are labeled. Typically, this is done by a human, and the human needs 30 minutes to level the picture. Okay? Um, so what we did was the following. I mean, you can nowadays prefer yeah, a complete platform of single atoms and carbons, and you will have all these spots, and they can contain up to 20% of metal in the topmost layer. Huh? And basically, there are different uh, places where people is thinking about how to accelerate and tag all these materials. Huh? So you can, you can really work on the acquisition, improve the acquisition, or do this automated image analysis that was a part that we were concentrating. Okay. The whole idea we we'll get would be to upgrade the information that we are doing. In many of the experimental situations that we are facing in single laptops, but not only in single laptops, most of the information that we get, we use it in a very qualitative manner. So we spend lots of money in getting something that is not really quantitative. And the reason why it's not really quantitative is because the data analysis is far too complex or, or it's not it really, because it's not really automated. Huh? It's a key one that does in long way. So that would be like in the microscopy here, what the people will tend to do is just sitting, mark where the atoms are. And then for that, you, that, that would be the, the whole idea of the picture will be to say, okay, these atoms are separate. Okay, they are far away one from the other. And that would be the idea hmm? to know if they are separated or if they are generating down dimers or larger, um, larger structures. So, what we did here with our colleagues was you know, try to learn. Uh, Try to learn. I don't know, yeah. Try to learn from the images that have been tagged by humans. Okay. Then, then you crop these very small um, parts. I think that it's, it's pronounced. Yeah. Oh no, no. So try to try to crop, crop different um, uh, different units. So you, you basically you crop different levels here. I mean, you crop different. Uh, parts here, and you have kind of a sliding um, window that it's marking if the atom, if there is some brightness or not, okay? Then you do some kind of a little bit of preprocessing just to average what is the zero for, for the different um, positions in here in the lattice. And then what you can do is um, feed a, a convolutional neural network. And then when you are doing this and you're fixing a threshold, actually the machine is able to level all the uh, points in the uh, image. Okay. 
Now, there are a couple of surprises here. One of them is related to the fact that humans do are very good at marking um, bright points here, but not in the bright area. In the bright area, they were not the, the microscopy was not really um, marking, um, identifying a lot of okay? And this is because humans, they don't see the contrast in very massive areas, okay? This was one thing I didn't know. Now, the other thing is that, yeah, we don't have a ground truth for these kind of problems. So it's very difficult to say if we were right and she was right or someone in between was right. Mm -hmm. But the truth is that we pass from 30 minutes of this sampling to something that takes less than seconds, okay? Now, the other thing is these materials, this, this layer was, um, was learning on platinum supported I mean, on the platinum singulatus on the carbon uh, dopa with nitrogen. But it was able to recognize that we changed the sample from platinum to iron. It was able to also recognize the iron atoms. So there is something intrinsic in the, in the structure of the convolutional neural network that was able to see the contrast even if we were changing the metal atom. Okay? And that was very interesting to see. Okay. You can do all sorts of things in this kind of nightmares. As I was saying before, one of the other things that we have been checking, and that's also in the limits of this microscopy that I was telling you about, was to try to see if we could see different nuclearities of what these different nuclearities were doing. Okay. And by different nuclearities, I mean instead of having one molecular atom, having two or three, and seeing if this helps in the reaction, for instance, in the hydrogenation or in the Suzuki. That's a comparison between the two reactions. And actually, for the hydrogenation reaction, having three palladium uh, atoms is much better than having one. And the reason is that hydrogen splitting is easier. But for the Suzuki reaction, having one is much better than having three. Okay, so in here, you are really seeing how this ensemble concept, huh? active ensemble concept that we have in the books is really emerged if you are controlling the environment, the nuclearity and the environment of the different of the different atoms. Okay. One of the things that I have forgotten uh, to explain in the, in the Suzuki thing is that one of the nice things of the carbon nitride is that because it has this adaptive coordination, you never end up with a position where the whole system will collapse. And by this I mean, if you're having an organometallic uh, material, what it happens is that you need to make an empty space, so remove a ligand, you can, to coordinate something. And then you will have to remove another ligand to coordinate something else and so on, okay? So you go one by one in the coordination. In this one here, because it's so adaptive, we, we didn't need to remove two ligands. Because if you remove two ligands at the same time, then the probability that the whole thing recombines and starts forming a nanoparticle is much bigger. Okay? Which is, seems clear and seems easy to understand from a uh, general point of view. <clears throat> okay, now I'll change into the oxides. Um, and that's a little bit how we started with the oxides. We started by the oxides with the sodium oxide. Huh? And sodium oxide has uh, three facets, which are the most common one, but basically we concentrated in this sodium one zero zero surface. Okay? This is the one that gives the very nice cubes uh, that uh, many people have been uh, working in the literature. Okay, This is not the lowest energy surface. Actually, um, there are different ways of cutting it. I mean, principle, it should be a polar surface. So most, most of the people was understanding that the way to equilibrate, yeah. equilibrate the, the system was to remove half of the oxygens, and then you would have a surface where you will basically be nonpolar just by removing these extra oxygens that you are having in the system. But one of the things that we found at that time was, okay, once we are having Okay, you remove, you basically end up with rows that are one zero, one oxygen, one zero, one oxygen, 
and then you will have the next um, the next uh, the next position is basically empty because you have removed fifty percent of the oxygen. Now the remaining oxygens are so mobile on the surface that you cannot actually, if you have a three by three as this structure here, you can basically have as many distributions as, as all these possible oxygens as you may save them. Okay, because moving them is very cheap, and basically the energies of all these structures are very are distributed in this way here. So it's it's um, yeah in this way here. So basically, you end up with a distribution of different structures of oxygens that are in a very narrow energy window. Okay, so you can move the oxygens around. Formally, the surface is the same. Okay, it contains the same amount of oxygen, and it's the configurational energy what is stabilizing uh, your material. And actually, we found out that that was the case in this particular case that we could. Uh, that we could really stabilize the material by having at least, for instance, this 400K, by having different distributions of the oxygens and it was contributing to the overall stability of the whole system, okay? If you can move the oxygens around so easily and you start thinking about where to put your um, single atoms, then, then you can have the following, okay? Now you will see what really. This is where the rows are complete. This is when I move an oxygen and I end up with a coordination from a platinum atom that gives a three. And here I can move another one and get a four for coordinated. And this is just by moving some of the oxygens that are the same oxide surface. Actually, if you start thinking, in principle, if we should have one, one structure for each of those. But when we were calculating, we ended up having more than one electronic structure for each of these systems, okay? So even if you are in coordination two, we could locate the states of where platinum zero, states of where platinum plus, and the states of where platinum two plus. And the energy difference between these two, you can see this one, this is relatively small, okay? So what comes from here, it's a very uh, simple way of saying that this might be dynamic, that no longer the state of your metal inside the oxide is a single state, but because the energies are so close together and because we have easy um, uh, transfer path from the platinum to the CM atoms that are on the surface, we should represent these kind of structures by the ensemble of these electronic structures, okay? And these electronic structures, in these cases, they, they differ because in one case you have one platinum atom and no cu three plus, but then when you start putting one cu one electron into the oxide, then these can have different positions, okay? So you will have platinum plus and then three pluses in different positions, and this is so gives this bunch of structures here, and when you're dropping the second, you will even have more positions. So basically, you end up with larger um, manifolds. Okay? So basically, if you do that, you cannot claim that this structure field will have a single oxidation state. You can have more than one. Okay? And in principle, if you do this with um, DFT, you know that DFT is supposed to be a ground state theory. So why, why, how come I can count to other states? And the reason for that is that, yeah, let's see if I can find it here. Oh, okay. Here is a moving, so you, you can see, you can see, yeah, this is, this is not French. This is a little bit, yeah, to wake you up. <laughs> but, but the whole idea is that you see, you will see, I mean, this is, this was in a small unit cell because we couldn't do uh, bigger at that time. But the idea is that you would see the different serial models are getting highlighted when they are uh, getting uh, the electron coming from, from the surface in the front, I mean, from the metal in terms of this polar energy. Okay, the, the whole idea comes back to this um, density of states. Okay, so that would be the density of states of, of Syria 
as a native cereal. Huh? And that here will be, um, yeah, that will, here will be a platinum. And basically, you can start thinking of how you stabilize these systems. The whole idea is the following. Because you are having a distortion when you are having a CO3 plus a species, okay? It distorts a lot the geometry. So when you distort the geometry, you can stabilize these states, okay? And when you stabilize these states, they are at the same position of the, as the platinum states. Actually, they become lower than the platinum states. So basically, you can inject lower the platinum states. From the platinum space to the cereal space. Now, if there is some other geometry where this is no longer the case, huh? so now imagine that because of the phonon, this cereal gets more constrained by the oxygens, these states will be higher, and now the injection will go in the other direction. Okay? This is how you can understand, and basically, it can be seen here when you, okay. Yeah, you see these 3D states that are built here, and basically they're close by to the platinum states. Basically, you can allow the injection. Okay. That's how we understood that the whole system was working. <clears throat> okay, so we built a very, um, yeah, very small model for that. And, and the whole idea was okay, saying, okay, if I have platinum and I have the oxide, how can I go from this state to this state here, but basically from the platinum zero to the platinum plus, okay? And it only worked for the platinum plus, but I'm showing you this here because I want to show you something later on. The whole idea was, okay, let's take how much, how much is the uh, ionization potential, how much is the energy gain that I'm getting for charging the oxide, and then here I will have some um, energy for the distortion, energy for the covalent, um, so for the metal oxygen bond that I'm forming, and then some Coulomb uh, interaction, because when I will have a charge, then I will have some Coulomb thing. And if you, if you add the whole terms, basically, this is compensated by the large Coulomb term that you are generating, and this is the driving force in the energy that you are getting. Huh? So that's equivalent to this level that I was showing you. So there is a possibility to make a very small model just taking into account the ionization potential, the energy that you gain by putting one electron into the oxide, and the electrostatics that you are generating by the fact that you are distorting the lattice and that you are generating two charges that are different from the ones that you're getting. This is the whole idea of the model. Huh? Very rough. That it worked well for only one system. And of course, one of the other things I'm having, so we were tempted to go and check what was the role of these different states in a typical reaction, and that's a zero uh, oxidation. Okay, so in principle, to see if, if some of the different states were most likely for some of the intermediates or were helping uh, the appearance of some of the intermediates. Okay, and it's, it seems that that's really possible. And this is related to what happens if instead of having a normal crystalline CO surface, you would have some bulk, um, some oxygen magnesis in the material. This is what we were discussing with Martin. That would be the polarons, okay? So you, you basically have here, if you have a non-defective system, you will spend most of the time uh, on platinum plus and platinum two plus in my systems, okay? But if you have a defective material, the um, lifetime of this species here will change. Hmm? So you will have for longer platinum plus compared to platinum two plus in one of our model systems. And this is, if you think, if you have a lot of polarons, then you will not have a place where to drop your polarons. Okay, because it's already occupied, or maybe because you will have extra repulsion. So it might be that you're having two terms, one energetic and the other one um, because of the probabilities of finding things. So basically, you end up with lifetimes that are changed from the lifetimes here just by having more defects, more polarons that are sitting in different places. Okay. 
that's a little bit complex, but we think that that's, that's an important way of how the oxide is fixing um, initial um, charges into the metals, okay? Because you are kind of feeling the state of these sites you are talking um, in this direction. <clears throat> That might be relevant if you don't have an experimental proof, it would be lovely <laughs> to have one. <laughs> okay. Then we are, of course, when you start doing these kind of things, you say, okay, you have found this kind of weird behavior for platinum or for cerium. How, how common should this kind of effect be? Huh? So, one of the things that we did, I'm touching things. <laughs> So one of the things that we did was, okay, let's take half of the periodic table and see um, what these things can happen. And you can see that there are many cases where the multiplets, they really compete or they are really almost overlapping, okay? For different metals, this is a very, very, very uh, dominant um, feature in some of the materials, okay? Um, so rhodium, for instance, I mean, look, look at the uh, complexity Yeah, look at this part here. It's basically you don't know where to sit. Huh? You can have basically everything. And they are in the same energy range. And this happens in several other places where you have more than one. In some cases, it's not the stable with respect to the aggressive energy, but in some other cases, they are. Huh? And these are the three uh, structures that I was telling you before. So basically, it seems that it could be very dominant in this kind of of materials, um, this kind of um, electric transfer. <laughs> so, of course, we have this beautiful model um, with the whole couple cycle saying, okay, ionization potential is one of the uh, things that is defining if this kind of phenomenon of the electron transfer will occur. Um, and then we know that there are some other things that might contribute, huh? the electrostatics and some other things. So we decided to go and try to see if we could find an equation for this, okay? Yeah, that looks a scary, the equation looks a little bit scary, but um, I want to show you a little bit more about the procedure, okay? So in this case, we were having about 700 points, hmm? and that's enough if you want to train a model that is not based on, um, yeah, that it's a uh, machine learning kind of model. In this case, what we did was the following. Some of our colleagues from the uh, nearby university, Marta Sales and Rogelio Tudilla, they, um, they had this idea of um, a Bayesian machine scientist that is able to look for functional forms. So we were not looking for, we were not looking for fitting the points with a neural net. I mean, a neural network would have done it very nicely here. But we wanted to understand where were the main important parts of the physics. And for this, I feel happier if I have an equation. Okay, now you can see the equation, and I have seen some faces there saying, okay, it doesn't look very nice for the equation there. I fully agree <laughs> that it doesn't look very nice. But it's true that, so these kind of algorithms, they do adapt the functional form to your set of data. And what we wanted to see is if, if it was possible to find a functional form and what were the ingredients that were needed in order to find this functional form. Okay. So for this, we did, I mean, this is very similar to what I have shown you before, but in this case, I in the first case, I told you we only use the ionization potential and, and the Coulomb forces just to rebalance the things. But in here we have different combinations, different atoms, a huh? bunch of states, and, uh, and we were having uh, different contributions because some, some of the different atoms were uh, really doping two, three, and up to four electrons on the surface. So basically what we took here was we employed one of some um, feature selections and, and we use uh, the metal, the ionization potentials, and the radius because these radius it turns out to be uh, quite important. 
the coordination numbers you can see here. And we know that uh, the electrostatics were important huh, from the bone hammer model. So here they are taking us at these distances between the metal and the serum and the distance between the two serum atoms. Okay? And we didn't even took the distances explicitly, but actually the positions in the lattice is pretty plus ones and zeros. Okay. So, um, so we tried to merge these two parts here huh, to understand if we could retrieve something. And actually the equation, uh, the system was not able to find an equation if we put too many variables, okay? In this um, symbolic regression, going more than with five variables doesn't really work because then the space gets too crazy, huh? It's far too large, you cannot do that. But, what the system was able to retrieve is that the most important defining part for this equation was related to the metal atom. Okay, so when you define the metal atom with a few properties here related to the binding energies of the metal atom to oxygen, then you will define the major part of the energy of your system. And then there was a second part that we refit in a separate way that that was the part corresponding to the oxide. And in this part corresponding to the oxide, we were finding the different repulsions between the different CO3 atoms that we were living on the surface, okay? And also to the metal. So basically, there was a lot of electrostatics in this second part. Now, what I want to show also here is that all these kind of um, regressions that are symbolic regressions they do present difficulties because this is not the time of the kind of um, way, huh? the simplest way to represent these things. We cannot identify the electrostatics in a very simple way, or we cannot identify some of the things in a very simple way. Huh? The equations, they look far too complicated, far too difficult in order to map them to the physical uh, priors that we have. But at the same time, they do resemble some of the features that we have identified in the very, um, in the very simple model. Okay, so that might be a way to go. We don't know for how much. Of course, it's always a little bit unusual to see all these continuums and things like that. That they go, uh, they look very scary because we don't know how to interpret them. In many cases, this serves. Yeah, yeah. In many cases, this serves to separate the different atoms. Okay, so it's it's a way that the um, algorithm looks for separation of atoms, which is not the way that we would use this um, separation of the different groups. Okay, so so we have seen some of the things that are um, that are incorporated into these machine scientists that uh, yeah. They will need a little bit more work in order to retrieve um, symbolic uh, regressions, symbolic forms for our functionals that could help us a little bit more in the interpretation. Okay, this is what uh, I want to do. And, and with, yeah. and with this, I want, I want to tell you so all our data, oh man. All of the data is basically stored here. So if you see one of our papers, we are storing all the data here. We have the data and the metadata. So basically you can search. Um, the whole idea is that when we publish a paper, we typically submit a paper with a DOI that corresponds to the experimental data. And you can go through all the structures, read London, if, if you wish. <laughs> Okay, or just plug them or just open them to see that they are correct or, or not. Okay, but this is this is the way that we are approaching um, open science nowadays, and I think it's a valuable way. And um, yeah, we are also learning a lot from the populations from other people. This is not sitting in my office. Okay, we managed to get some space in um, in the supercomputer center, so. I'm not looking at the structures of anyone if they are not public, but you can make your structures public um, if you wish. Okay. So, with this, uh, I hope I have convinced you that these single atom catalysts they exist. They can make, uh, they can be made stable, and uh, I hope that they will be made 
useful and the product to be ready to see very soon. Um, we can identify the associated descriptors, not, not only for activity, also for reactivity and basically for stability. And um, yeah, as you have seen, there's some new electronic properties due to miniaturization, particularly on the oxides, and we think that they might have a lot of potential. And with this, I want to thank 